This week on the Back Table Podcast. We now have this really incredible insight to a patient's foot, especially in the setting of a wound, where I can tell you, Dr. Constantino, that maybe this patient has an anatomical variation on the top of the foot, and they do not have a dorsal metatarsal artery. In fact, they have a huge lateral tarsal artery with no flow going to the great toe. Or I can tell you that the arcuate artery is retrograde or the lateral plantar is retrograde and the perfusion is class four. So when we can tell you the anatomy, the perfusion and flow direction, it provides incredible insight to number one, is the wound getting enough flow, but also in, in decision of uh, surgical treatment. So will this patient heal just a toe amputation or do they truly need a transmetatarsal amputation? Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Back Table Podcast, your source for all things endovascular. You can find all previous episodes of our podcast on iTunes, Spotify, and on backtable.com. With over 500,000 patients treated globally, Impact Admiral Drug Coated Balloon is the market leading DCB for treatment of femoral popliteal disease. Learn more about how Impact Admiral DCB can affect reintervention rates for patients with PAD by visiting medtronic.com slash five year DCB. Have you guys heard the International Symposium on Endovascular Therapy, otherwise known as ISET, has moved their 2021 conference from January to May 9th through May 11th. We're excited to head to Hollywood, Florida for their 33rd annual meeting and looking forward to the live cases, late breaking data, and connecting with multidisciplinary faculty. We're even more excited to offer Backtable listeners a discount to attend. You can register at ISET.org, that's I-S-E-T dot org with discount code BACKTABLE to save 15% on the tuition. Enjoy. This is Mary Costantino as your guest host this week, and I'm very excited to introduce our guest today, Jill Somerset. Welcome, Jill. Thank you so much for the invitation to be part of this podcast. So, Jill, why don't you tell us a little bit about your background? Who are you? What do you do? Where did you come from? Here you are on back table. How'd you get here? So I live in a small town called Hood River, Oregon, and I've been doing vascular ultrasound for the last 20 years. I was originally trained in Seattle, Washington, and worked for a company called Pacific Vascular Ultrasound Company. And so we did on-call services, inpatient and outpatient, and operative um, coverage for TCD emboli monitoring, for endarterectomies, and open bypass Then I transitioned to the University of Washington, where I worked in their research department, mainly on the CREST trial. And then my family and myself moved down to Oregon, and I've been working at Peace Health Thoracic and Vascular Surgery for the last 10 years. And more recently, I have the privilege of working with you at Advanced Vascular Centers in your OBL. And that is truly an honor. (laughs) Yeah, so I ran into Jill at a local meeting, and we were really desperate for an ultrasound tech because um, you never appreciate ultrasound techs until you have one that's maybe not what you're used to. And I, you know, I'd seen Jill on LinkedIn and these types of places dealing with some pretty significant PAD cases and limb salvage. So I just asked her if she knew anybody. She was anybody was looking for a job because we were in in real need. And she indicated that she might be interested in working in an OBL setting. And um, I was consider myself extremely fortunate. Jill comes to my lab on Wednesdays and sometimes on Mondays, and we get to do interoperative cases. And uh, we are doing a lot of things with foot perfusion and vessel size. So that's how Jill and I met. And we are having a very enjoyable Wednesday. Wednesdays are my favorite days because it's a Jill day. And her um, ability has spread throughout our lab. So now that my whole staff knows when we see a complex patient, we just call it a Jill patient. <laughs> and, and that patient waits until Wednesdays. So how did you get into vascular ultrasound? What are your favorite things in to do in vascular ultrasound? And what got you so interested in arterial ultrasound? Well, I think it has a lot to do with the uh, physicians that I've worked with in the past who were um, very supportive and really relied and and find a lot of value in the vascular technologists. And so I suppose not only my interest in peripheral arterial kind of launched forward, but I also worked with a vascular surgeon on pelvic congestion syndrome stuff back in 2013. And we developed that transabdominal duplex originally to try to really find more answers for 
women who were having the, uh, vulvar varicose veins and needed further testing. So I would say that it's the involvement of the physician that has really launched me forward because we, you are invested in my team and myself, and we actually sat down every week for an hour and went over cases. And I learned what a va how a vascular surgeon thinks. And I've learned by you, Dr. Constantino, as an interventional radiologist, how you think. And that's how I think I've really now gotten into the weeds and have this love of vascular specialty. And I suppose that would, that's maybe a good story. And I also think, I also teach their registry for the RPVI. And so when you teach, you also glean more knowledge because you have to educate. So um, I do a lot of side consulting as well for pelvic congestion and advanced arterial duplex ultrasound. And now with PAT, it's just, it's been really, really enjoyable for me personally as in my career. Yeah. I mean, as long as I've known you, it seems like it's the putting the, together the pieces, the clinical, the surgical slash endovascular and the ultrasound that is your favorite thing to do. Correct me if I'm wrong on that. And then it seems like that would be a common thing with vascular techs, but I guess not. I feel like ultrasound, it's so critical for the ultrasound techs to be good at what they do and to capture representative images and to be up to date on the disease conditions. But I guess that's not always the case. Is that true? And where where are we with that? Yeah, I would agree. I don't think it's always true. In fact, I find myself really feeling fortunate every day that I get to work with vascular surgeon and, and interventional radiologist who, who love to work with us. Some vascular technologists are more, they just do their study, they send off their report, and they don't get that, that constant conversation, that feedback. And so I, I think we need more of that. We need more collaboration because vascular techs, if, you, if we know what you want, we will give it to you. And so I urge all of the vascular techs and actually physicians too, to collaborate more and more, especially on these difficult peripheral arterial cases. Yeah. I mean, being on, being someone who didn't have um, the vascular tech I needed for about a year, I started sending all my patients out and I can tell you, I get back these reports from major hospital systems, accredited labs that just are numbers. They don't really mean anything. And then I'm trying, put, trying to put the clinical together with the list of numbers on some computer spread out thing. And the conclusion is always some vague something. It just, none of it helps me. It's, it reminds me of this uh, statement that one of my older attendings used to say, garbage in, garbage out. And I basically came to rely on these outside ultrasounds as, is the femoral artery open or closed? And that was about it because the tibial work was, you know, 50% accurate and definitely they weren't getting into plantar work. So if I'm not actually doing the ultrasound in my own lab or you're doing it and we're talking about it, if they ever end up somewhere else, the furthest amount of information I will accept is basically femoral artery open or closed and the rest of it I can't really <laughs> count on. Because, you know, yeah. we get and these reports that are just velocities and then say, oh, mild atherosclerotic disease. And it's like, what is that? That that means nothing to me. I don't even know what to do with that. Well, and I think, you know, me, I like to actually just plan your case for you. <laughs> so yes. I like to try to think like, two steps ahead yeah. of where you should access and what you're... <laughs> Yeah. Jill's like, oh, you're so good. You're so good. You are so good at what you do. I'm like, yeah, because when I walk into the room, you said, hey, I wouldn't go into that artery here. I would go into here and put a wire through that. And I think you'll open it up. And I'm like, all right, you know, how could you not win? <laughs> but I guess that's the point, right? Between what you and I, what you and I do together, our sort of win of CTO crossings and revascularization and improving perfusion and healing wounds is so so good because we are so prepared going into it. Can you talk a little bit about, I know you have strong feelings about what you bring to the table or what any ultrasound tech can bring to the table in terms of um, preoperative planning? Yeah, I think it's that advanced just education going beyond just being a vascular tech, but really understanding the the interventionalist plan. So if I know that you like to do an anagrade access, so but I'm still going to look at the contralateral up and over access just in case you need to do that. And then there's some physicians who are just primary pedal. And so if if we know your approach, we can be efficient in making sure that we measure those distal pedal vessels for access or if there's no groin access, maybe it's radial. So I think just thinking beyond just the duplex is really helpful. 
Yeah, the other thing with the pedal that you often give me is flow direction in the foot. So if we know the flow to the foot's coming from the AT, maybe we'll go through the PT first, just in case I mess it up, which of course I'm always hoping not to do, but you know, then I feel like we still have that AT forward perfusion. So knowing the flow dynamics of the foot, where how the blood's getting there is really helpful for knowing which vessels are most important and which vessels, if um, one has to be sacrificed, not that I ever want a vessel to be sacrificed, but <laughs> yes. if, if it happens, it's ideally going to happen to the less critical vessel. So that leads us right into one of my favorite things, which is plantar acceleration time or pedal acceleration time. This is, it's like, I want to save this for the end because it's like the big Christmas gift but I feel like we should not uh, delay the audience any further of what the real meat of this discussion is about, which is plantar acceleration time or pedal acceleration time. Can you tell us what were you doing when you had that idea? Where were you sitting? How did you figure this out? And for the audience, Jill basically invented this technique and published it and had to work with physicians to sort of get it out there. But this was her brainchild sitting around playing with her ultrasound machine one day, figuring out what kind of information she could give to the interventionalist that we didn't already have. So Jill, first question, please describe and define PAT. Well, thank you for that good introduction of PAT. So the story behind it is in 2017, I was fortunate enough to be actually just watching Dr. Howard Feldman down in Roseburg, Oregon. He's an interventional cardiologist, and I was down there teaching some of his texts how to image uh, the common femoral artery. And so I watched his case, and he ballooned around the whole pedal arch, and I, I've never, I had never seen that before. And I thought, I asked him after the case, well, how do you know it stays open? Is What's your follow-up like? And he said, oh, I don't. If the wound heals, then it's probably open. And I was so excited and I was so intrigued at that moment. I had a three-hour drive home and I, I didn't even go home. I went straight to my vascular lab and I scanned my own foot and thought, oh my gosh, I can see my pedal arch. And so the next day I started scanning every single patient's foot. And I just, I couldn't believe how well we could see these pedal vessels. I work with four vascular surgeons. I probably drive them crazy because I was just so over the moon about this. So over time they got on board and we started um, tracking our data. We looked at waveform analysis. We looked at velocity. We were trying to figure out what is the best way to assess perfusion in the pedal vessels now that we can see it. Ultimately, it ended up being acceleration time, and we've used acceleration time in other beds of the body, in the renal, distal renal arteries, the common femoral artery, the carotid arteries, and now we've just applied acceleration time to the foot. And uh, so we started just tracking, and I would journal entry every single day with uh, the patient's ABI and TBI and clinical symptoms. Gosh, we just started seeing these this incredible correlation and started just tracking all of our data. So that was the beginning of plantar acceleration time. Now, it, it's called plantar acceleration time initially because we knew where to look at the lateral plantar artery in our data set. And then now fast forward and we look at the entire pedal arch and that's why the names change and there's more papers coming out to reflect that. But so that first initial paper was just looking at the lateral plantar artery, comparing that to ABIs that were, these patients were non-diabetic, non-renal failure patients. So ABIs was reliable, but not only does PAT correlate with ABIs, but also really correlates with clinical symptoms. So that's kind of the backstory of how PAT was born. And it's just taken off like wildfire. And to be honest, it has created so much joy and it's so amazing to scan these patients' feet and help them in, de in decision-making. And I think I'm really excited, especially working with you, Dr. Constantino. We can see the changes of PAT interoperatively and postoperatively. And so there's, there's a lot of value to PAT. Yeah. As you're talking, I'm thinking, well, two things. First of all, you're like the Alexander Fleming of foot perfusion, trying it on yourself, journaling it and making big discoveries. But the other thing I'm thinking is all the exciting ways we use it. And I'm trying not to be so um, exuberant because there's so many fun times that we use this. Oh, we need to talk about the class, PAT class. Can you describe the actual numbers and how you classify PAT? 
Yeah, so the original criteria, we retrospectively evaluated 499 limbs. Again, all of those patients were non-diabetic, non-renal failure patients, and we, we correlated PAT to ABIs, and we found a statistical significant that broke into four classifications. So PAT class goes from class one being normal, and that's equivalent to a normal ABI, to class two, which is mild disease. So that would be equivalent to like a 0.7 ABI all the way to class three and then four being the worst. So four class four PAT, which is an acceleration time of greater than 225 milliseconds. That is consistent with rest pain and tissue loss. So if you remember any two numbers out of the PAT classification, 120 milliseconds or less is normal and 225 milliseconds or greater is abnormal. And basically what that is, is we're measuring the onset of systole to the peak of systole of the arterial waveform. And we can gather that acceleration time and apply it to the criteria. So I'm ha- I have a couple of ways in mind that we use it, but let's talk. Why don't you tell the audience how you and I use this on a typical day in the OBL? So we scan all of our patients in Dr. Constantino's lab as on an outpatient setting. Um, but, and we do pedal acceleration time on every single arterial patient. It can be for foot pain, for claudication, and of course, for tissue loss and rest pain. And this is just an extension of the arterial duplex. We can do a limited arterial duplex, uh, and that's billable for PAT. It's the 93926 CPT code. So it's all billable. So we use PAT in the preoperative ultrasound, and then when she does her case, I like to mark on the patient's foot where the vessel is that I'm, if it's right next to the wound, and we'll do a PAT right before the patient rolls into the cath lab, and then I know exactly where to place my probe when she's delivering therapy, and um, we're oftentimes the only ones in the cath lab to jump up and down and (laughs) and be so excited when we see that, that dramatic change, and it is especially in the anagrade access, it is instant. If once she does atherectomy and does balloon angioplasty, that PAT changes on the table. And then we use it postoperatively as well for wound surveillance. Yeah. So we, we just had a case um, last week where the guy had an occluded femoral artery, an occluded PTFE fem pop graft, and an occluded fem tib venous graft, started having grafts in 1984, had surgical groins bilaterally, and reported a seven-hour surgery for some sort of leg aneurysm from his previous surgeries that, quote, didn't work, quote. And so we knew his groins were a nightmare. He had scars all over his legs. Jill mapped him. He had a profunda that had elevated velocities and then branches going into his AT. His contralateral groin was heavily calcified, about 60%, 70% bulky calcification, so it was unfavorable. He was on Plavix for um, coronary stents, and he was obese with a large panis. <laughs> so Jill hands me that ultrasound, and we're like, so I did this radially, and that's not the interesting part, because I think a lot of us could do that, and I just went down into the profunda atherectomized the profunda, ballooned the profunda. And what I had, I used Jill for was she went on down to that foot and he had a class four PAT. And I just, I didn't know if I was making any difference in this foot. After I pushed the intervention as far as I could uh, from the profunda, she looked at the PAT and it was like a class three, which is not exactly where we want it, but much improved. So I knew that I had actually reestablished flow down to his foot. He has an ulcer um, and a pretty ischemic foot. And then the decision was, do I need to do a tibial attempt at any sort of tibial revascularization? He included AT and PT, and he just had a single um, perineal. So complex case. And knowing that I had improved the flow to the foot with just the atherectomy and angioplasty, the perineal, allowed me to stop then to see how he was doing over the next couple of days. And that was a really a critical information because had I gone down to these guys, AT and PT, 
I, I don't know um, that he had enough flow in them to really keep them open. If I had, you know, put a sheath in, I think I would have given myself just about 15 minutes to do the case because I was worried about um, occluding one of his tibials. So really critical information that allowed me to make um, a decision I was pretty confident about. The other way I used Jill in that case was that I didn't, he, he did have a small aneurysm, the common femoral artery right before the profunda. And I didn't want to atherectomize in the aneurysm. So I had the wire down the profunda. And I was envisioning the orbital atherectomy device flying around in the aneurysm. So I wanted to start right at the origin of the, of the calcification. And I'd marked it with IVIS, but by the, you know, he had moved and all this. And it was, I mean, we're talking millimeters of difference. So I had her ultrasound over the origin of the profunda. I lined up the atherectomy device exactly where the calcium started. And I knew exactly how far I had to go. So it was a completely visualized atherectomy, which helped because of the proximal aneurysm. So you can gather, you can gain a lot of confidence in these procedures when you have a, a tech that can actually direct you. And I think anytime we can actually see what we're doing and have some less subjective and more objective data, that's valuable. So one of the common questions too is, do you need to have a dedicated vascular technologist in the cath lab? And my answer is yes, because not only can we monitor PAT, but we can also be really valuable for just what you spoke about, which is extravascular ultrasound. We're a new set of eyes that we can get right at the CTO cap with wires or catheters or, you know, place, uh, help place balloons or stents extravascular. So I think that in itself is an extra tool that can be really helpful. Yeah. Can you describe how you do that? Where can you describe just the flow of the case? Let's say I have a CTO. It's, and it's on a Jill day, which of course they always will be. Describe your role in the cath lab. You don't just sit there the whole time. I mean, you're out working and coming in and out. So describe for the audience how the flow of that work goes. So in my opinion, we always have to plan. I did the preoperative duplex ultrasound prior to the case. So I should know that patient's perfusion and occlusions and CTO caps better than you. And so when I do the pre-op marking, I mark on the patient's leg where the CTO caps are. So I know the length of occlusion and I know exactly where to place my probe during the case. I also mark on the patient's foot. So I know where, if I'm going to look at the arcuate artery, the dorsal metatarsal artery, or the lateral plantar, I know exactly where to go. And so then when the patient rolls in, I'm prepped and ready to go because the physician is always asking questions like, oh, how far do I have left to go? Or where's the cap? Or what does this look like? So I always want to be two steps ahead of you. And uh, my time, as we know, well, time in the cath lab is precious. We have to be quick and efficient. So as a vascular tech, we get into precarious positions to reach under the drape or go over if they're full leg prep. But while you're holding uh, a balloon for prolonged inflation, I'm going to get my ultrasound ready. I know exactly what the settings should be. Therefore, when the balloon is deflated and you pull it out, I can go straight to the patient's area that we need to look at and be really efficient. And so I think that there's a lot of prep that goes into these cases. So the ultrasound pack can be very efficient. Yeah. So Jill will often, she will do the ultrasound on the patient and then preoperatively, like she said, she knows the patient better than I do at that point. We also are doing a lot of patients with um, kidney disease, as most of us doing a lot of PAD are. And so I'm, I have dilute contrast. I'm, I'm usually trying to use between 20 and 30 cc's of contrast at most. So these big, beautiful runs that I used to get in the hospital when you power inject through the pigtail with an aorta, <laughs> in the aorta, you get these like beautiful images. They just don't happen because I'm trying to use um, a dilute amount of contrast. So I can sometimes see the distal um, reconstituted vessels and sometimes not, but it actually doesn't matter. So I just reduce the contrast dose between Ivis and Jill. I actually have done full CTOs with under five cc's of contrast. And that's pretty incredible. We love, we love to do that. So Jill will, Jill will usually be outside of the lab and I'll be working away and she'll be doing stuff out there. And I anticipate I'm getting the sheath up and over going anti-grade. I usually like to go anti-grade, kind of getting the lay of the land, figuring out what I want to do. And if I anticipate, I think I'm going to need Jill, I'll have my nurse or somebody go out and get her 
And it takes her, I would say, under five minutes, probably under three. The machine's already in the room. The machine's positioned. It's turned on. The patient's name is inputted in there. The patient's marked. She knows exactly where she's going. She just comes in. I don't think she keeps lead on, but she just gets her lead on cap and you know mask and everything. Um, and she gets sterile and pops around and starts ultrasounding. And that takes, I would say, under two minutes. So we have no delay. Doing this adds zero delay. And in fact, it saves a ton of time, contrast, and runs. So if I have a CTO, I'll get positioned right in that cap. And of course, I'll try the old school way. Like I'll, I'll try to open it just through Angio. But if this thing is heavily calcified, which I know because uh, we've talked about it before, maybe it's got a heavy, has got a big, you know, calcified cap, but the rest of it's soft versus a 10 centimeter heavily calcified, just pile of rock segment um, versus all soft. So I'll give a little college try, try to poke a wire through there. But if it doesn't go or it's budding or, you know, it's going into that horrible little collateral that is, you know, coming off right where the cap is, I'm already calling for Jill. And that allows me to position my catheter right up against the cap. And it allows me to do what I call really dangerous things. <laughs> I'll say, I'm about to do a really dangerous thing. But I don't really say that out loud because you can't say that out loud with, a, with an awake patient. But I'll get the back end. It's all stuff that, you know, we know how to do, but we don't just don't do like to do that much. Reverse ends. I've used the reverse end of a weighted wire. Man, that thing is sharp as heck. But if I know I'm interluminal and I'm right next to that cap and I'm watching, I can see where my catheter is. Uh, maybe I have a trailblazer down there. Maybe I just have a regular comfy catheter. It doesn't matter. You got the catheter, you know, poked right in there. You can take that wire and you can shove really hard. I mean, I'm, I actually want to get a needle. That's my next thing. Cause I just need to pop through that cap. And if I know I'm interluminal and I'm watching with ultrasound, you can be really aggressive. And we've gotten through some really incredible CTOs that way. And just, we just kind of the heavily calcified ones, we just marched down and I'll ask Jill 14 times, my interluminal, my interluminal, my interluminal. And the, these are the cases where by angio, the wires making a little curvy twist and turn. You don't really know, am I going around a calcification or am I going subintimal or am I out of the vessel entirely? I like to say interluminal because I do, because I went subintimal once and have always regretted it. So I like to say interluminal. So Jill will come in and out on those cases. When we're trying to get across a CTO, she's going to stay there the whole time. And I'm going to do basically the whole CTO by, by ultrasound. The only time you can't do it is when that calcium shadows and we miss like a centimeter. And sometimes you got to watch that under angio. So, and then we always have a moment of celebration if we actually get through and then we, we move along with the rest of the case and Jill's done until the PAT time. So Jill, where is PAT being used and how are you seeing it used nationally and worldwide? So I think we have to remember that this technique is still pretty young. It's only three years um, in the making. And so um, just trying to get publications out, we have so much great data that we're trying to get published and um, trying to teach at a lot of, or speak at a lot of national and international meetings. And at the Society for Vascular Ultrasound is a place where a lot of vascular techs uh, attend that meeting. So we'll do hands-on training there and a, a number of lectures. So the information's getting out. I think where we're at now is a lot of people wanna learn. And so we're trying to develop that platform of how to teach them. Right now they can learn at the Society for Vascular Ultrasound annual meeting or just me personally. And so that what the training entails is four hours of Zoom conferencing and lecture, and then the text will go out and scan 10 limbs and then report back to me uh, so I can validate all 10 of those limbs. So that's how we're doing it right now. So if, if you're anybody uh, listening, if you're interested in having your tech trained, I would encourage it has to be physician and tech because everyone has to understand how to utilize this information. I guess I would just say to call me and we can set up some sort of training, which would be really fantastic. And then it's also going internationally. Uh, there's some really great research that's going to get underway in Australia, in New Zealand, in Italy, in Mexico. And so that's really exciting to see these projects start. And we'll see the collaboration at the end when we get our data back. 
Yeah, working side by side with Jill, I'm always seeing her on some international webinar with some doctor in Argentina. And that's what's so cool about medicine these days. You can teach people remotely and they can start to gather information. I do think working with you, it's important that it's not just the tech, not just the physician. This is something that if you want to start, uh, really needs to be collaborative. You want to you want to handpick your best vascular tech and your person who's most excited about limb salvage and then pick your physician who's most excited about <laughs> limb salvage and start there. Wouldn't you say, I feel like if a tech just showed up able to do it or a physician wanted to, wanted to do this without a tech that was that interested, it might be a little more difficult. Yes, I couldn't agree more. We have to ha be, have an open mind. This is a new concept. And so perhaps there are some people that may be a little bit more resistive to a new technique. And I think that the thing to remember is, is PAT is not the end all be all. It, this is a new additional data point that just helps you in your clinical decision making. We also know that PAT has limitations. It has these fake outs. So we should, we should know that. So if you don't mind me telling you what those limitations are. Definitely, please. So the first limitation or fake out can be isolated inflow disease. So if a patient has an occluded common iliac artery and then patent infrainguinal infrapapoteal arteries, the PAT is going to present as normal in the foot, but the velocity will be really low. So if the velocity is less than five centimeters per second in the foot, that is number one, very abnormal. But number two, uh, we just cannot rely on PAT. We're pushing the boundaries of our ultrasound system. We also see that, that five centimeter per second velocity and low cardiac output. I just scanned a patient the other day with an EF of 15% and the velocity was like two. And so of course he needs to get that fixed. But there are these fake outs that we have to be aware of. Another one is bypass surveillance. So remember, PAT is capturing all of the blood flow that goes down to the foot. That's the branches off the profunda, off the geniculate. So you can have an occluded SFA and the patient can walk a mile and they have normal PAT. And it's because PAT captures all of that collateral flow. So if you have a patient with a thumb pop bypass graft, we recommend that you actually do duplex surveillance because you can have a high grade distal anastomosis stenosis and the PAT will present as normal, but that's really bad because if the mid graph velocity is 20, that is looking at perhaps graph failure. So PAT may miss that because it's capturing all of that other collateral flow. So those are some things we have to address and publish and um, let people know where the pitfalls are. I think where PAT is really going to find its niche is in the CLTI patient in, in the, the diabetic foot wound or, or even just pure ischemia. When there's a wound involved, PAT is, does this really amazing job at capturing uh, what the perfusion is like. Is it enough to heal the wound? And we, we look at the entire pedal arch. So we look at the arcuate, the dorsal metatarsal artery, medial lateral and deep plantar. However, we can also look beyond that and look at the medial or lateral tarsal artery. We can look at that calcaneal uh, vessels going to the heel. So there's a lot of value in those, those wound patients. That is a perfect segue to one of my favorite ways. Another one of my favorite ways that we use plantar ultrasound, maybe less so PAT, but can you describe what you do for me <laughs> with foot ulcers? It's the most amazing thing ever. And it really helps understand a flow to the foot. And of course, what I'm talking about is like the dorsal metatarsal and how, how you approach ultrasound in a patient with a foot ulcer. So PAT not only stands for pedal acceleration time, but actually what it really stands for is perfusion, anatomy, and transducer, which is flow direction. So we now have this really incredible insight to a patient's foot, especially in the setting of a wound where I can tell you, Dr. Constantino, that maybe this patient has an anatomical variation on the top of the foot and they do not have a dorsal metatarsal artery. In fact, they have a huge lateral tarsal artery with no flow going to the great toe. Or I can tell you that the arcuate artery is retrograde or the lateral plantar is retrograde and the perfusion is class four. So when we can tell you the anatomy, the perfusion and flow direction, it provides incredible insight to number one is the wound getting enough flow, but also in, in decision of uh, surgical treatment. So 
will this patient heal just a toe amputation or do they truly need a transmetatarsal amputation? Or if the pedal arch is not intact, maybe they need to be thoughtful of where they do their amputation. Yeah, that's one thing I think that the people who refer to us really like is that we'll take the ulcer and do an ultrasound right at the ulcer bed. And Jill will be able to say how much flow is getting to that ulcer. And usually we're doing an intervention regardless if it, there's an ulcer. And then we're looking at, did we change the flow to the ulcer? So we just had a similar guy who's had, I keep reopening his tibials and they keep shutting down. And so the debate that they're having on the surgical side between the podiatry and orthopedics is, are they going to amputate a toe or are they going to amputate at midfoot? And we were able to bring him in and Jill did his ultrasound and showed that he had great arcuate arch flow. He just was lacking flow through his second dorsal metatarsal. And that convinced them to just take the toe and not the, not the midfoot. So Jill, actually, that's a great segue into the case you did this morning. So it's Sunday afternoon. It's a beautiful day in Oregon. We just survived wildfires and we're in the midst of COVID and it's a beautiful day outside. So everybody wants to go outside and hang out. And what is Jill Somerset doing? Jill, tell the audience what you did this morning. <laughs> oh, I just can't, I can't resist. So I was uh, on my way to the hospital to scan a patient who presented with a diabetic foot uh, first toe ulcer and the patient had a, a huge infection. So a couple of days ago, they did source control and did just the first toe amputation or first ray amputation. And then I was called to assess perfusion in the foot. And this patient has class four PAT. Class four is consistent with tissue loss and rest pain. So what we can, what, what PAT can provide is we can expedite care right to vascular surgery for intervention. We're not sitting on things versus we've got, I've gotten the same call for a patient with a diabetic foot ulcer with normal perfusion. And that is not a vascular intervention. That would be more orthopedic or podiatry to, to take care of that patient. So, you know, I think the inpatient diabetic foot program can gain a lot of value by having uh, a vascular tech to do these PAT studies on all patients with foot wounds. Yeah, I'm laughing at the visual, like the cartoon of a patient diabetic foot wound hitting the door. And it, like the old way is like all these people in coats, um, like throttling each other and battling each other out, like old school about who has to admit the patient. And then and then you come in, um, you know, for those of you who have never seen Jill's picture, she's she's a gymnast. And she's got this like long blonde hair. And I can see her like floating in and just ultrasounding and just having that decide everything. Like, I feel like all the wars, all the battles would just stop when Jill, when Jill just floats in and, and tells people this needs revascularization or this needs the amputation. <laughs> <laughs> You're like a, a superhero, P like putting out fires across ERs all over the world. So that's, that's a really interesting way of, of helping sort of an admit of directing patient care. I mean, think about how huge that is if it comes down to just figuring out the ultrasound and figuring out where the patient's best admitted. I think it would make, yeah. I, I wish more of those patients were admitted to interventional radiology, but right now it's like vascular surgery is the dumping ground of, you know, everybody. And I think in some hospitals around here that I've worked with, they vascular surgery is, is not, it has stood up to be the dumping ground, which has made internal medicine the dumping ground of every diabetic foot ulcer. And so I know that there's, it's different in every hospital, but it would just seem like gathering information so that no one group feels too put upon um, would be really helpful. And Jill talks about driving into the hospital. She lives three hours from the hospital. She lives near Mount Hood. So when she drives in real fast to go check on a wound. It's really out of true dedication to, to her craft that she's doing it because it's, it's not down the street. So Jill, tell me if you have, I know you talked about if anybody listening wants to start doing this in their practice, is there any place that you think this can't work? I mean, you, you work in an OBL, you work in a hospital, 
personally, I think this could work anywhere. It could work in a clinic. I mean, I don't think I just, you just need an ultrasound and a gel and you could make this happen. What's your ideal scenario? What's your ideal scenario to work in? But answer that question after you answer, how would any listener start this program? It sounds like they would find a physician in a tech and they'd contact you. So who would you say should not implement a program like this? If anybody. I think PAT can be implemented into any program. They just have to have a updated ultrasound system because we now know that if the scale of the ultrasound system does not drop below 10 centimeters uh, per second, that is a limitation. So you need to have a current ultrasound system and then also a skilled vascular technologist. So like anything, we have to learn the anatomy. So in the protocol that I that's published in the Journal for Vascular Ultrasound, there's a proper way to put the indicator of the probe towards a certain direction for the top of the foot and the bottom of the foot. So there's a developed protocol, there's developed technique. So with with that, I would say right now, it is just me training, but there is definitely, I have what we're working on is a center for excellence of training for um, advanced arterial duplex ultrasound. And I think that in combination with having a physician and a tech to uh, to hold a program like that could be very valuable. Do you want to tell the audience what your favorite equipment is? And I should note that I don't think Jill is, I mean, you have no corporate relationships, right? Nobody pays you to do anything. Is that right? I deliver educational content to Philips, but I do use a Philips Epic ultrasound system, but I'm not biased. I you and I have a Siemens ultrasound system that does fantastic work. Again, it just needs to be a current model of ultrasound. So I'm not biased. Yeah. I've never detected any bias in you at all. In fact, I'm trying to make you more biased. I'm trying to monetize <laughs> then, you, Jill. <laughs> I can make money off then, of you somehow. I'm kidding. <laughs> oh, we have so much fun working uh, together. I know. As far as probe selection, you just need, you don't need anything special. You need your standard linear probe that we use for carotid duplex or arterial studies. And then a high frequency probe, like a hockey stick probe or a 15 to 18 megahertz probe also works. And we only use it really for the top of the foot because some of these patients' feet are so thin that they need a little higher frequency probe. But, you know, for the most part, I use a linear probe. So nothing fancy. Jumping straight to the venous disease, because I know we're going to have to wrap up soon, but I really want the world to know, how do you use ultrasound in the detection of Maytherner and trying to differentiate between venous nutcracker, Maytherner, ovarian, vein, reflux, and peripheral venous disease? So a colleague of mine named Brian Sapp out of Georgia developed this incredible way to evaluate a waveform in the groin. And um, his work hasn't been published yet, but I have um, gleaned a lot of information with him, from him. And so we can now detect if the waveform in the common femoral vein is abnormal to indirectly suggest that there is more proximal obstruction in the iliac veins. And I think for you and I, and that technique really has been pretty right on. And so when we talk about new techniques in vascular ultrasound, PAT, looking at venous waveforms in the groin, um, the techs are on the front line. We scan these patients all day long. And so when we start to look at things from a different perspective, new techniques come out. And I think as long as we have the data to back it, you know, this will just benefit all of the patients that we scan on a daily basis. So I love pelvic venous disease, as you know, and so that study is um, it's a big comprehensive study. We look at left renal vein compression, we look at ovarian vein reflux, and iliac vein reflux. And, you know, looking far beyond just venous reflux of the lower extremities, but really how to help these patients with chronic pelvis venous insufficiency. And of course, you yeah. do a great job by treating them. I think it's a, a good combination. Well, I'm kind of laughing because I see all these patients and they've got, you know, the whole, all the symptoms and I'm just an under treater. I'm just so conservative and some, I'm in a really conservative phase right now with a venous stent. And I, some of these picture, you know, these images we see on LinkedIn where there, it looks like, you know, it looks pretty open to me. They get stented and I just have gotten more and more conservative, um, not because of any bad outcome. I just, these stents are going to be staying in these thin women for so long. And I've just probably, I have probably have between five and 10 outstanding patients right now that I feel like need stents, but I'm just not really wanting to put them in. And so I send them to Jill and I'm like, find, find something. And inevitably she says, 
it's Mae Thurner. I'm like, yeah, but don't you think I can do the ovarians first or the legs periphery? N- no, it's Mae Thurner. And the, they, we go back and forth and inevitably I end up, you know, Ivy seeing them and Jill's always right about all this stuff, but you've actually made my job more challenging out of my, my debate of when the right, perfect time to put a Venus stent in, which is, is always, if I wish I can answer that question, but your ability to detect May Thurner by a simple ultrasound is unmatchable of anybody I've ever seen, which is supposed to make my job easier, except for if it's the answer is I have to do something I don't really feel like I want to do. <laughs> but it definitely helps patients. So final question. And I think everybody should know about these great socks. I just find this so funny. Jill's socks. I I'm sock obsessed because I talk about compression all day long. Um, having developed venous insufficiency after pregnancy and coming from before this pregnancy, thinking that venous insufficiency was all made up and it was just ridiculous. And we needed to be spending our time doing real things like treating cancer So, you know, of course I get pregnant and develop venous disease and I haven't been treated. So I have to wear compression all the time for myself. And over the years, we have a company in Portland called Socket to Me, which makes great socks. And I just, I'm talking about socks and looking at socks all day long. Well, then these amazing flow socks, you know, I saw these flow socks that mapped out the arteries and veins and they're my favorite pairs. And I actually use them in clinic Um, on Mondays is my clinic day. And I always wear my flow socks so that when I'm talking about tibials, I just, I just like show the patient my socks. Like that's the artery that we have to open up, which I think is so cool. So tell me about the flow socks. Where did it come from? And who buys these things? Like, where do you sell them? And what do you use them for? And how'd you think of that? (laughs) The socks? Yes. So I run our multidisciplinary limb salvage program at Peace Health, and um, gosh, we've had it now for three years. So when I wanted to celebrate our one-year anniversary, I wanted to develop something that brought a sense of community and um, people to be proud to be part of this multidisciplinary program to save limbs. And so I work with a company called The Sock Guy down in California, and I just thought about putting vessels out on a sock and that's kind of how it started out. And I just gave them away for free. And then people, people's friends saw the socks and wanted to buy them and they kind of just took a life of their own. And then I started to see the joy that socks brought to people. And so I, gosh, I think I've done like eight different inter- iterations of colors and adding disease and half of them I give away for free because truly what we all do makes a difference in people's lives. And if those socks can bring a smile to a surgeon's face or an interventionalist face, I mean, I just wanted, I just wanted something to bring continuity to um, people in this fight against amputation. That's the most amazing thing about you and why it is so fun to work with you is I, f- I feel like your goal is always to spread disease awareness, um, save limbs. You're just using your your brain and your knowledge and your skill set, and you're just advancing medicine. And I feel like that's I, that's number one through 99 and figuring out how to monetize anything is like not even on your radar, which is, you know, when you, when you lead with passion and knowledge and skill and ability and willingness to work hard, the rest of it all follows. And you're just such an amazing example of that. And we just, we need, we all need to get back to that and be that in medicine. I feel like it used to be a lot more like that. And it's so refreshing to be able to work with you and we just get to geek out on this stuff. And then I get to wear your cool socks. <laughs> well, I was going to say, likewise. I mean, I, I truly am very lucky to work with not only four great vascular surgeons, but but you, Dr. Constantino, who who brings that passion and energy to work every single day. You care about your patients so much and you put a lot of value and you, you allow me to be part of your team and your daily practice. And so I thank you for that because that's the reason why I come to your office every single day. Wow. I um, am hoping to steal you away from that other place soon and have you full time. (laughs) (laughs) Do you have any final words, anything you'd like to add that I've missed out on? Well, the only thing that I would add is there's some excitement of um, pre-DVA mapping coming in the future. I know that that's becoming more of a common technique and uh, pedal ultrasound can be very helpful to map out those not only arteries, but also veins to help with the preoperative mapping for DVA. So that's, that's an exciting place to discover as well. 
Great. Well, thank you so much. I just cannot wait to see you at work. We have so much fun together. Jill and I always talk about how we need to actually meet up outside of work, but all of us, we just are home with families and jobs and she's running all over saving limbs. So we never get to hang out. So it was really awesome spending Sunday afternoon with you. Yes, it was. Maybe next time we'll do it over with a glass of wine and a glass um, of wine. <laughs> bike right down the gorge or something. Yes, I would love that. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much. And thank I'll see you. you soon. All right. Bye. Bye-bye.